Welcome to Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. Each week, you will learn how to grow your wealth through real estate investing, be introduced to the players that are getting it done, and learn how you can get involved. And now, here's your host, Darren Batchelder. Hello, everyone. Today, we have a very special guest. We've got Lisa Landry. Lisa, appreciate you coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So just a little bit on how we know each other. Um, so we are both part of the same multifamily mentorship group, uh, the Brad Sumrock Group, uh, based here in Dallas. And when Lisa got started, she was you know, she was looking to learn like most people are when they get in. And, and um, I was managing a property and she said, hey, I'll come out, you know, free of charge and just come out and, and hang out and see if I can add any value and learn. And she came out and we just happened to be when we were painting the property and we'll get into her background, but she's got a design background. And so she was giving us pointers on paint colors and what we could do and it was just so nice because I'm more of a business guy and not a design guy. So it was nice to have Lisa on the property um, giving advice. So with that, um, Lisa, can you share with the listeners how many properties and how many units you're invested in? Yes, um, I'm actually a GP in one property right now. It's a $10 million property and it's in the Dallas area and that's 108 units. I just had an LP investment go full cycle, so that one's already sold, and, and that one did really well, actually. Um, and we're under contract on another deal in Dallas right now that's a $25 million property that should be closing before too long. It's, it's crazy. Now, were, did, did you invest in small multifamily before getting involved in, no, in the group? No, no. Is it? Isn't it crazy? Like when you just throw out these numbers, like oh, a ten million dollar deal, a twenty five million dollar, but it becomes kind of common when you start seeing all all yeah. these other people doing it. But that's a big thing is is getting surrounded by other people that are knocking down these big properties, and all of a sudden you're like, hey, if they could do it, I can do it. Yeah, I mean that first ten million dollar one, I was thinking, oh my gosh, ten million dollars, and then now this second one is twenty five million dollars, and you know, you start going, whoa, you know, what, what's happening? Uh, it's, it's a lot to get your mind around, but you're right. When you have friends and other syndicators and other operators that are closing $50 million deals and $60 million deals, it puts it in perspective and, and you think, well, $25 is not that big. I can handle this. Right. And and you have partners that are you're partnering with that have experience and, and um, that helps as well. So, hey, if you could, before we get going further, um, can you share with the listeners kind of your background? Because you've got a unique background that plays, I think, very well into, into the multifamily space. Sure. I started an interior design firm over 20 years ago now and started just out in residential and then added commercial properties because we had clients who we decorated their homes and they had businesses. A lot of them were business owners and they would want us to come decorate their businesses also. So we added on commercial and then about 15 years ago, a local property management company reached out to me, and he's in our area, and he, he said, I found you on your website. I manage 45 apartment communities in the DFW area, and I have 10 of them that need major renovations done this year, and we're wondering if you would help, you know, help us do those. So I, I was honest with him and said, I've never worked on multifamily before. I'm happy to come take a look. And drove up to the property, the first one for us to look at. And I really had in my mind that it was going to be like a really nice property, you know, like a luxury apartment or something. <laughs> Before you drove up, right? <laughs> Before I drove up. <laughs> and I was so surprised. You know, it was like a C-class property. And I had to keep my face really neutral and not like show that I was surprised. And um, so, you know, we looked around at the property and I realized that his whole portfolio that they managed was were B and C-class properties. And so then I realized once we looked at the model unit and the leasing office and the exterior paint and, you know, help with landscaping and those kind of things, that it's really all the things that we'd been doing in residential and commercial. So we agreed right. to help him with those 10 that, that year, and we did them all in that one year. And I ended up having five of them professionally photographed, and I entered them into this international design contest that was judged by magazine editors from across the country. And they didn't have a multifamily category. They just had commercial. So I entered them in that category, and they ended up sweeping that category. They won first, second, and third place. And they were all Holy like cow, really? B and C class properties, you know. So we were so surprised and, um, you know, excited. And 
we we thought we love multifamily. So we started doing more and more and more. And now we've done probably a couple of hundred properties across the country. We, we added on outside of Texas uh, in the last couple of years. And, you know, we find that we get with groups that buy properties and they keep buying further away from us. <laughs> so we've started going wherever they go. And, and so we decorate now we're known the known as the interior designer of multifamily investing, because I'm also an investor. Um, and our company is called Landry Designs. So when I did the first, the deal that you came on property with, um, again, I'm like a business guy. I don't have a, an eye for colors and for design. And, and so I was like, well, I'm responsible for implementing this rehab, but I don't have that skill set, you know. Um, and so I went looking for people that I knew, you know, because I wanted to hire people that I, you know, trusted and that I knew. But they were they were more single family, you know, background. And I had them redesign the the leasing center, and um, I had a number of people provide me with some guidance on paint colors, but I, I kept looking at them and being like, no, I wanted something different. And then no, I, I went to like three different people um, before I finally, uh, you know, said yes. But I would have loved to had somebody, a turnkey person to, to help uh, provide that guidance. You know, as a lead syndicator, you know, you're responsible for those budget dollars. But if that's not your skill set, you want to bring on a, a team member to help you know, consult. And so that's, that's amazing. Um, talk about, you know, we, in the multifamily world, we talk about multi value add a lot, right? Value add. And I was having coffee this morning with somebody and he was like, well, what does that mean? You know, and well, painting the exterior, making it nicer, putting in new amenities. And so talk about how your design firm comes in and helps, you know, turn that around and improve the whole community. I think that when people are putting their LOIs in, that's when we need to get involved. You know, that's the very beginning phase. We just need to be kind of considered part of the team. Um, when you're starting to get estimates from your property management company, from contractors, all those kinds of things, we can give you a number to plug into your pro forma for the design side of things. And, you know, I find that this industry, the multifamily industry, is so male-dominated and, and driven and now it's maybe not quite so much anymore, but <clears throat> just like you mentioned, guys love working on all the construction and the pergolas and the grill stations and, you know, all of the outside kind of elements. And they sort of pass over, I think, sometimes the interior elements. And what I find from many years of working on these properties now is that we're trying to get the NOI up. You know, that's the goal. How do we get the rents up and the expenses down? And when you think about who leases these apartments, it's typically decided by a woman. That's the resident, you know, that comes in. So we need to do whatever we can to make sure that the first impression of the exterior, the first impression of the leasing office, the first impression of the model unit, if there is one, um, the first impression of the amenities, all of those things need to look amazing. We've got, you know, 15 seconds to make a first impression in each one of those areas. So what can we do? within the budget that you've put into your pro forma um, to get the biggest bang for the buck. And when you work with a design team, we're taking that off of the operator's plate. We're, like you mentioned, more turnkey, where we're saying, um, we're going to you know, take your budget, see what all we can get for that budget range, and we give you budget ranges that we think uh, you should work within. So once you've given us the budget range, we work on all the designs, we present via Zoom, and we give you options. Then you just select... And then we work with your contractor if there's things that need to be done that are, you know, paint or chandeliers hung, um, you know, electrical work, walls taken down, those kinds of things. We can work in conjunction with your team and with the contractor to make sure that things get done. I mean, we create checklists and follow the process all the way through. So really, we have just a simple system and we're trying to, again, take as much off of you as possible um, and give you you know, a finished product that looks amazing, that's jaw-dropping. These, these people that come in, they're typically, um, you know, they would love to live in a house. So they go look at a lot of model homes. That's what we want it to look like when they come in. So the leasing right. office, we feel like, is really like the jewel of the property. And that's the space that, you know, they're going to decide, do I want to live here or not, before they even look at the model unit. 
So little things like when you walk up to the property, uh, when you walk up to the leasing office, first of all, can you even find the leasing office? Is there directional signage to it? So you can easily find it, <laughs> right. which I hate that when you can't find it. Uh, it's right. so irritating, and that's not what you want. You don't want an irritation is the very first thing, you know. So making sure there's directional signage that's easy to find. Then making sure that that sidewalk is perfectly clean and swept every single day. Making sure that rug that's out there with your logo on it, you know, hopefully, is spotless, that it's vacuumed every single day. That that front door is not chipped. The paint's not chipped. When you open the door, is the door handle all old and, you know, rusty looking, or is it fresh and polished i'm talking b and c class that's what we specialize in it doesn't matter sure, yeah you know when you open the door does it squeak does it need wd-40 on it those little things are really important and then once that door is opened what is it you know what are they seeing visually what are the smells what are the sounds does someone stand up and greet them immediately not just sit down you know uh, and you know, greet them just period. They need to be greeted when they come in, but the standing up thing and even coming around from the desk, I think is really important. So all those little elements come into play in that first 15 seconds of your first impression. And then we can really look at, okay, you know, this is a lounge area in the leasing office. This is a little business center. This is, you know, a little conference table. Here's the leasing station, uh, all the different element. Here's a coffee station or a beverage station. Here's a popcorn area. All those elements, you know, come into play after they're already in the space. And we're assessing each one of those um, little things like what does the lighting look like? And a lot of times people just put in recess lighting or they leave fluorescent lighting. If we can take down the fluorescence and put in, you know, recessed LEDs, cans, um, and then add like a chandelier or two to the space. I'm telling you, that makes such a big difference. It's like the jewelry for the space. And this is what makes it look like a model home. So those don't have to be real expensive things, but they are very transformative things in people's minds. Same thing when they walk to the model unit, you know, that whole breezeway would better be perfectly clean. The light in that breezeway needs to not have bugs all in it, it needs to be on and bright and clean. Um, the, you know, little clip by the door where they put their notices needs to be clean, not all chipped up and, you know, rusty. Um, the front door to that model unit needs to be painted. The, if there's a rug there, it needs to be spotlessly clean. Every little thing inside the model unit from, you know, fingerprints on faucets to, um, fresh, you know, switch covers, all of those elements people are looking at crooked paint lines, you know, chipped things on mirrors, so we, we really help. We're, we're part of your team where we're assessing every one of those things that you're probably just overlooking and yeah, making absolutely. a checklist of this is what we see here. This is what we would recommend fixing. We'll do this part. Your maintenance guy can do this part. Here's his checklist. Here's our checklist. Here's your checklist. Um, and, you know, work as a cohesive team. And what we find is once we get these things done, um, First of all, potential residents, they want to live there, you know, when they come into this kind of space with this kind of service. Uh, second of all, current residents love it when the property is upgraded and everything looks great. People tell me a lot of times, well, people don't go in the leasing office very much. Residents go, don't go in the leasing office because they pay online. They're supposed to do their maintenance requests online. Um, they do come in the leasing office all the time. We're on those properties. We're on site a lot. And that is a revolving door. People come in to say hi. People come in to say they couldn't get their card to work on something. They come in to say somebody parked in their reserved parking space. Um, they, they don't want to put their maintenance request online. They just want to tell somebody or check on it. So people are in and out all the time. So the current residents, if you can get them to renew, you know, that's way cheaper than doing a unit turn if you don't have to. Uh, and bring it up to market rent. So that's two elements, the potential residents and the current residents. The third element, though, that's really overlooked, and we call this the trifecta, is the on-site staff. They love working in this space that looks so amazing. The lighting's right. It's functional. The traffic paths are right. All the little areas look great. They want to come to work in that kind of environment so you have less turnover, Plus, they're I, didn't even, I didn't even think of that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't even think of that. That's, they're your, that's they're great. the people running the property, you know, so if right. you can make them happy and they want to they have to work. They have pride in where they're working. Yes. You know, and then they feel more comfortable charging those higher rents 
because right. they know the property has been upgraded and everything looks so much nicer that you're elevating the entire property. So we, we really focus on the leasing office first. Um, if you are going to have a model unit and then, you know, work on the amenities, look at the exterior paint, all those areas are what we can really help with. Yeah, that's huge. So when, when I got going maybe four years ago, I, I was thinking, well, you want to have a nice interior, you, you know, renovated unit. And so that's where your focus was, would be. And, but then I had a lot of syndicators that said, no, you, and the first thing you do is the exterior because people drive by and they see that the owners are putting money into it and they want it. Then they're curious and they want to see the interior, but the first place they're going to go is the leasing office. Yep. And some people may think that it's not good money spent. Um, but you know, that that's huge when somebody comes in and they're like, wow, that's the first impression, you know, wow. Versus, Oh, this is kind of a dump, you know? And, and then, all right, I'll go see what the unit looks like, but they're in their mind. They're already thinking that, you know, th yes. this place skimps, yes. you know, on, so th that's huge. But one thing you said that surprised me was that you like to get involved at the LOI stage. Um, you know, depending on the syndicator, I know some syndicators, I mean, they put out a lot of LOIs before yeah. they, they win a deal. So that's a lot of work where you're not, you know, winning the deal either if they don't win the deal. So, you know, talk to that. I mean, that's how do you how do you approach that? Yeah. And really what we're doing, it's not a lot of work on our part because we it's have a, not. we have a multifamily menu of services and there are budget ranges based on how big the leasing office is, how many spaces there are, how many on site staff there are. So that's really just a formula that we can plug in once we learn a little bit about the property. I mean, we can be on a 15 minute call with you and know enough to be able to give the budget range, you know, for the property. That, I mean, that's huge. That's like you're talking to an expert that does it every day versus, you know, the syndicator who maybe they get, you know, two, three deals a year. And now they're having to, you know, come up with the budget for that. And they think it's a lot of work, but for somebody that's doing that every day and you've been in business for 20 years. Um, so it's, it's like second nature to you. Yep. And we, we find too that, you know, you mentioned people coming to look at properties. A lot of times when people are looking at apartments, they'll go to many apartments in the same day. They go and look at yeah. a bunch. So whatever you can do to set yourself apart and that greeting thing at the beginning where you stand up and come around the desk and greet someone, that's one little thing that you know just kind of tips the edge there, tips it over the edge. Um, but then also they, they might remember, oh, that was that really cool blue leasing office or I love that model unit with the orange or, you know, you've got to do something to set yourself apart when they're going from place to place to place. And maybe you're more expensive than some other place they're looking at. And is it worth it to them? Right. Right. That's huge. Um, the other thing you said that was interesting was that the women are typically the decision makers. So uh, as you were speaking, I was kind of thinking about that, and I'm I'm thinking, okay, well, yeah, you have single moms that are that are renting, you have single dads that are renting, but then, so say that I don't know what the dynamic is in terms of whether it's fifty fifty, but then you have couples, you know, and families, and it is the wife that's going to or the girlfriend that's going to say, yeah, I, that, this is a place we want to live, you know the. The guy might be the one that's talking. Yes. But when they leave and they make the decision, the woman is saying, "No, that place is, you know, was dirty." Yeah. I don't I don't want to live there. Yeah. And then or it wasn't welcoming or something. Yeah, whatever the yeah. case may be. Mm -hmm. And and then he's the one that makes the call and says, "You know, no, we're going to pass." Um so you think that he's the decision maker, but really it's it's the wife or the girlfriend. That's it really interesting. Is. It really is because if she's not happy, they're not living there. You know what right. I mean? If she doesn't like it, they're not going to live there. Um, and it's so that's why we're always thinking, you know, to cater to people who really love design and who like to watch HTTV and you know like to go look at model homes and uh, again all those elements of the light, how bright it is, the smells, the sounds, all those kind of things. Um, really play into it. And I think guys are, I don't know, they're more easygoing about these things usually, but women are real particular about where we live. 
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And if you think about it, you know, if we're, for getting that bang for the buck, I mean, if you have 100 units or 200 units, you know, you're renovating one leasing office to give an impression for all the, you know, for the entire property. Yeah. And so... Um, it's money well spent. I've had it, some operators that we started with, and the very first time they budgeted a smaller amount. They didn't even ask us how much. That's just what they put in. And once they got it under contract, they reached out. And it was really too small of an amount. So we did what we could. I mean, it looked nice. It just didn't look like over the top, you know, cool. Right. Um, but he told me, Lisa, I promise you on the next one, we will put more. <laughs> we will put what you have told us now we should have put and they do, and we do every one of their properties across the country now. And, That's you know, it is money so well spent because, I mean, they'll hold these for not that long. You know, they, they get their business plan done, and um, and then they sell for so much more money. So you mentioned the unit interiors also, and I do yeah. think that's important. Um, we actually help with unit interior design packages. So let's say you have a particular vendor that your property management company likes to work with, or two or three vendors even, sure. then we can go to those vendors' websites and put together packages, unit interiors design packages, so that they can just be replicated, you know, over time. Um, we're testing, like a lot of times we'll recommend testing, and we're doing this on my property right now, um, you know, like a silver, a gold, and a platinum package, and putting different elements in those. So, like the silver might have everything pretty basic and then the gold has backsplash and black appliances and, um, you know, the fur down removed, those kinds of things. Just a little, everything's a little bit nicer. That one's $50 a month more than the silver. And then the platinum has everything the gold has, but it also has pendant lights over the bar with the fur down that was removed in the kitchen area and also a micro hood. And this is a big deal, the micro hood, because a lot of times these apartment uh, kitchens are so small and the countertop space is so limited that if they have a big old giant microwave on their counter, it's taking most of their counter space up. So the micro hood is a great amenity to add in that's, you know, a microwave vent hood combination that doesn't take up any space at all. Um, and it, you know, it costs a little bit more to put in, but then we can charge $50 a month more for that uh, unit that platinum unit that only really has the micro hood and the pendant lights in addition every time we do one of those platinum units and that's the one that we have on the, the website also it it leases immediately even though it's more expensive because once they see it you know that's what they want so then if you see that leasing up do you start making more platinums we do we're assessing yeah. each unit as it comes available to see what we have available in that size um and what rented recently for what pricing and you know we're assessing it on a weekly basis so talk about model units you know some people will think that well that's a unit that you're not renting you know so do yeah. you see value in having model units or or not? It depends on the size. So if the property is about 100 units, then I think, no, you probably don't need a model unit. What we did on the property that I am an asset manager on that's 108 units is we took a, a, a vacant unit and did a make ready on it, and then we staged it. So Landry Designs has a staging division also if it's in the DFW area of Texas. Um, so we staged the model. Then it was professionally photographed and videoed. And then we destaged it so that we were able to rent it out. But those images of that model are on the website so that they can show them. But if you have, you know, like 200 units, 150 to 200 units or more, then I think you should definitely have a model because just that amount of rent you're getting each month, you're going to lease probably so many more from people coming through and actually getting to walk a model. They get to see it, feel it, touch it, look at how the windows are, look at the balcony, you know, it's it's so much easier for them to visualize themselves living there with with a model and what it can actually for, look like. Versus, I'm thinking about one, you know a property that the property that you came on, and you know, I know the leasing manager sometimes would be showing a unit and the flooring's down, but maybe the countertops haven't been resurfaced yeah. or you know it's been painted, but you yes. know there's still some, the fans haven't been new fans haven't been put in, whatever the case may be, and they're having to paint the vision versus yes you know seeing the model and 
and it's kind of like the leasing office. It's like a wow. Yeah. You know, and I property, want my place to look like that. Property management companies, some, some of them, it's a rule that you cannot show a, a vacant unit that's not finished. That's their rule. Yeah. The better property management companies require that because it's better to not see it at all than see it in right. a bad state. Yeah. I can, I can see that. I can see that for sure. Um, and then there's something called mini models. I'm not sure if you've heard of that or talked no. about that. What is, what is That's that? where if you have, uh, let's say you don't have a model unit and you do have some vacants, then you can set up a mini model. So you're not putting any furniture or anything in it, but you're putting a few accessories in the kitchen, a couple of accessories in the bathroom. You're putting maybe a plant in the bedroom, um, just something so it looks like it's staged a little bit, a little bit home feeling. If there's a bar, maybe there's a placemat with some dishes and some wine glasses and, you know, where it looks like you could imagine yourself living there. So slightly right. staged. And then as soon as that one's leased, you can do one of two things. You can move all those things to your next mini model, or you can tell the resident if they sign their lease that day that they get to keep all of those. Oh, cool. So you talked about following people around to around the country. Like, so how does that work? I mean, are you, are they paying for your travel and your, you know, your hotels and how long are you staying? And, you know, yeah. that could get costly. Yeah. The way that we're doing it right now is we are doing, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a Zoom call first so that we can learn about the property. We're looking at the website, pictures, learning about the tenant base, ha having you tell us everything you can about the property so that we can learn about it. Um, then we're giving the budget range. Then we get a retainer to start working on the, the designs, and the retainer is 10% of the budget. And then once we get the retainer, we fly to the property or drive, depending on how far away it is. We fly to the property. We take all the pictures. We measure everything. We come back and do the designs in, studio, in our studio. And then we present via Zoom, and you pick your favorites. And we take a deposit at that time, a 50% deposit. And then when everything's in, we actually, we have big delivery trucks. We actually, our installation team drives to that property and installs everything. Because what we find with, with all of these things that are furniture and rugs and lamps and pictures and mirrors and chandeliers, all these different things, so much can get damaged with freight, particularly nowadays, that you don't know what it's going to look like when you open it. If everything was shipped to the property and your team had to open all of this stuff to see if it was okay... To build it, I mean, building these desks takes hours and hours. And then what if the corner's broken or something, you know? So we really take, again, all of that off of the operator's plate. We're receiving everything in our warehouses, and then we drive and deliver it. And then in the in the interim, while everything's on order, we're working with your team and your contractor and your property management company to make sure that any kind of construction elements are being done and be ready for us to come. Very, very cool. So um, when you... When so talk about some of the construction elements. So you would end up having the rehab construction crew do what versus what you guys do? Well, it could be, for example, maybe we're doing exterior paint selection and we're doing renderings, but you want to add the cedar planks, you know, on the balconies. So that could be being done or the, all the exterior paint could be being done. If it's inside the leasing office and we're working on that, it could be maybe we're going to have a mural painted on one wall or maybe we're going to put wood on a wall um, or maybe you're taking some walls down, or maybe you're changing out the flooring and putting the flooring that's in the units in there. So there's always little things that need to be done. Maybe you're changing sure. the front door. Uh, maybe you're changing all the hardware. Maybe you're building a cabinet in. Maybe you're putting a business center in that has a built-in cabinet. So we, we assist with directing on all those things, but that on-site team is doing all their, their own work and construction. Okay, so you got a, you've got a syndicator team that has a property that maybe it's definitely C-class and maybe in a C-class area and the, the team doesn't really think that they have the budget or that it, that it will add value because the tenant base just wants a clean, affordable place to, to live and, and that's going to break the bank. What do you tell that team? I just say based on experience, that's just not true at all, because in C-class in particular, you know, they've got a lot of properties they can go look at, and you've got to do something to set yourself apart. So um, we have budget ranges, and so if we're in a C-class, 
you know, we're going to recommend probably that you be at the end of that, the lower end of that budget range instead of the higher end of the budget range. So you can pick, you know, where you want to be. That's how we choose how much are we going to put in there? What quality are we going to put in there? You know, making those choices to keep it within the budget range that's comfortable. Um, we've done lots and lots and lots of C-class properties. B and C are our sweet spot, and that's where we love to add value. And those- I've seen pictures of some of the places you've done. I'm like, oh my gosh, that looks so nice. I mean, the leasing office looks like an A-class property, you know? That's exactly. And, and, that's exactly what I mean, we want. Yeah, It really is amazing. And I see that, you know, even with like the new, um, new apartment complexes, I've the names that people use, like it could be, it's an apartment complex and they're calling it the mansions. Yeah. Like, well, you, it's not actually a mansion, but people want to live, you know, someplace that has a good name yeah. and that has a good feel to it, you know? So, um, that, and that branding, exciting. yeah, that branding that you mentioned is important. And we actually assist with that also. So if you have a sign company that you're working with, um, you know, we assist with the logos and, with the name, if you're trying to choose the name, we love the operators to get us involved. Like I, I had one not too long ago that the sign company had come up with four different, they already had decided on their name, but they had four different logos and color palettes that they had sent to the operator. And we had just started working with that team. And so he sent them to us and it ended up that we loved one, but we didn't like the color, but we really loved the color of another one. So we combined those two and it just turned out to be such a cool logo and branding and that's really important because you want your image to be cohesive for the whole property we would need to make sure that okay if the building's brick what color is the brick are you painting it or not if you're not we need to make sure that whatever we do goes with that including the logo you know if it's red brick or orange brick or yellow brick or whatever it is uh, or if it's stucco and you know those kinds of things so we're making sure that the branding is cohesive from the very beginning and you don't make expensive mistakes We find that a lot of times people go out and spend a lot of money on their own, trying to do their own model unit and their own leasing office, and they still don't look good at all. So why spend any money if it's not right? Yeah, no. I'm look like I said in the beginning. I know uh, I'm I'm not a design guy, so I would have I would love to have somebody like you. And and I didn't realize that you work all across the country. So like people that are listening that are east coast or wherever they they could still reach out and contact you yes we've been doing alabama them. and atlanta and nashville and phoenix oh, and just all over that's huge yeah um and you mentioned the c class the c class property and should they spend money and and i would just yeah. say you know if you're completely full if your vacancy is, is nil you know your rents are too low and, and if you're trying to elevate the rents, you need to elevate the property in some way to give them a reason, you know, to elevate the rents if you feel like they're What if low. vacancy is low? If vacancy is low, then you still need to do something. You just have to be strategic about what's it going to be, where to put the money exactly. What is the worst thing about the property? You know, I, I think that cleanliness and neatness are so important. Like one little trick that I always do is when you buy a property, I always tell the team, Get the dumpsters changed to brand new dumpsters before you sign your contract with the trash company, with the waste management Hmm. company, because those look so terrible when you drive around. And a lot of times they're not completely covered. Like maybe you have some sidewalls, but, you know, they're not completely covered and they're all dented and they look awful. Um, And so you can negotiate that before you sign your contract. Just say, we'll we'll sign with y'all again, but we want new dumpsters. So they bring those. And that's just one little thing that looks neat and nice. Does the bark park look neat and clean? You know, is everything picked up? Um, If you find an area on the property where there's always trash, like we've had one area where there were some shrubs and people kept putting like their McDonald's bags and stuff like that there, (laughs) just like under the shrub. So we put a nice trash can right there and it solved the problem. You know, you just need to make sure the trash can looks nice and it goes with the property and you place them strategically where they're needed. Same thing with the bark park. You know, they you need one that uh, has the bags built into it that you can easily that residents can easily use and put right there into the trash. So the two part, you know, trash system, not just, um, you know, a trash with no bags. No, that's that's cool. So. Why did you get involved with actually investing in real estate in addition to providing design services? 
well, for years I saw all these people making all this money, you know, and, and just doing <laughs> such a great job with it. And uh, a few years ago, actually, I started looking at getting out of the stock market because I was so concerned with the volatility there. And my dad is a commercial realtor and my son is actually a real estate investor. And both of them were saying, you should really be thinking about real estate. And so I started researching asset classes and there's so many different asset classes and right. when I saw multifamily, I thought, well, I know something about that. We've been working on these for so long. I know kind of the ins and outs, the behind the scenes that even the operators don't see because we're on site so much with just the property management team um, and kind of what happens behind the scenes, you know, is what, what we see. So I thought I'm going to research that. And so I started listening to hundreds of podcasts. I call it Podcast University uh, just to <laughs> learn the terminology and all these different players and how it works. And uh, I just... I just got sucked right in and loved every bit of it, read every book I could get my hands on. I started going to a lot of conferences just to meet as many people as I could. And, and then, you know, ended up signing up for the mentorship program that we're, that we're both in. Um, And I've been to lots of different ones and they're all good in different ways, you know, so it's mainly pick one that you like and you have this ecosystem in place then and just start meeting as many people as you possibly can. Um, I even started a, a meetup, a multifamily meetup that's monthly j- in January because I felt like I needed to pay it forward from all these people's meetups that I went to and, and all these different conferences and events that I went to. And so bringing people together. So where is that meetup? It's in DFW. It's in North oh. Arlington. Mm-hmm. So if you are in North Arlington, is it the first week of the month or is it, it the last week? It's always week of on the a month, Tuesday and it's either the third or the fourth Tuesday of the month. Okay. And it's on meetup.com. It's called Above and Beyond Multifamily Meetup. But it's just awesome. a great place to network. So I do think networking, you know, is super important. And why do you think networking is important? Because this is such a people business and you are not going to do business with these people if you don't know them. You know, the whole no like and trust thing that you talk about even, and I love listening to, to all the guests that you have on. Um, but you have to build these relationships. And at first I remember thinking, oh, I'm going to just get into a deal real fast, you know, and um, they don't know me from Adam and I didn't know them. And the other tip that I would say when I was starting out that I would do differently now is when I was first starting out, when I would meet someone, I would I would tell them a lot about me kind of at the beginning, you know, like a lot, like this is my whole background, you know, that kind of thing. And people don't really want that. They want to talk about themselves. So now what I do instead is when I meet someone new, um, I just immediately say, tell me about you. And then I do something called hot potato, which is where every time they give me an answer, I kind of, you know, repeat it in a different way and then hot potato it back to them with another question. So I keep them talking for as long as I possibly can, um, you know, as long as I think it's a a good personality mix. And then eventually if they do ask about me, sometimes they don't, you know, but if they do, then um, I just have sort of a shortened version, a really short little 30 second spiel about me. And they can ask more if they want to. But I think they... What's, what's the 30-second spiel? That I would put well, you on the spot. okay, it's like I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm a syndicator, you know, so if you're looking to invest, we could always talk about right. possibly partnering in the future. And I'm also known as the interior designer of multifamily investing. So if you have any properties, I'm happy to help you there. And I'm here to help you grow your business in any way I can. I mean, that's basically <laughs> short, short, short. That's, that's great. I mean, <laughs> look, there's, there really... I don't know another person that has your background that I have met through conferences and networking sessions and, um, and it's needed and, you know, value add is the name of the game is, you know, making the property nicer and people aren't really using, you know, services like yours enough. You know, I, I'm, I'm guilty of it as well. I'm in a lot of deals where I'm partnered up with people and, you know, they have their own ideas on what they want to do. And, you know, they're typically using, you know, a contractor and they're focused on the flooring and the paint and, and different things, but like not some of the niceties that will catch a woman's eye. Yep. And so I think that that understanding that I didn't understand that before, but (laughs) understanding that, um, makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm, I'm glad you shared that. Um, so talk about 
how did you get you in the beginning you were talking about your design services to a lot of people but you weren't getting asked to partner and ha- so how did you get your first gp deal um Actually, in our group, in our mentorship group, our mentor had said to post in our group what our goals were for the year. Uh, This was at the beginning of, I guess, two years ago or something now. And I posted that my goal was to GP this year and or co-GP this year. And here's what I bring to the table. Here's, you know, what I can offer as a team member. It was pretty short. And then I had like five or six people reach out to me and set up calls. And so we started building a relationship that way. And then I would see them at events. And then towards the end of that year, maybe summer of that year, one of them that I'd had a call with reached out and said, we just got a deal, you know, an LOI accepted. Do you want to be part of, of this deal? And uh, I was like, well, tell me about the deal, you know, and I went and looked at it and I was all in. So that's how I, I got to be um part of that first deal. The second one that I'm on are some other members that I'm part of a mastermind group with that's through that same mentorship group. And so I've just spent more time with those people because we go on these mastermind trips, you know, like three times a year. So I think that's it. I think it's instead of trying to get a hundred business cards at every event you go to and not really building any relationships at all, it's spending a lot more time with just fewer people And I found that if I sort of um, gravitate just to the people that I'm really compatible with personality wise, you know, if somebody if somebody irritates you at the beginning as a partner, like when you just meet them and they're a potential partner, if they irritate you, then you're going to have trouble. (laughs) This is like five years, you know, that you're with this person a lot. So that's what I found is to sort of just bounce off those people and then go on to other people that I really have a, a great feeling about, a great gut feeling about. And just spend more and more time with them and get to know them closer. And then literally just ask, like, you know, I'm looking for deals. Are you looking for deals? Do you think, you know, we would make good partners? I would love for us to do something together and just put it out there. And, and, you know, I've had so many people go, yes, I would love to partner with you. I didn't think you would even think about me, Um, which is exactly what I'm thinking, you know, also. And then when a deal comes about, like this one that, that I'm in right now that hasn't closed yet, we were needing some additional partners to fill different gaps, you know, fill little puzzle pieces. And so I immediately thought of these particular people and that's how it all starts coming together. I think it's important when you meet people at networking, when you give your, you know, about you, what you would bring to the table. So in my case, yeah. it's capital raising, um, branding, image, you know, and design, kind of overseeing CapEx work, that kind of stuff. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, the two things I, I wrote down based on what you said was one, you know, this is for the listeners benefit. Look, when you're, you have every one of you have value, right? That you can bring and you need to be able to communicate that to other people uh, quickly and effectively. And, but, you know, that's the whole thing is what do you bring to the table? Because the other partners, you know, you know, the seasoned people, they're, it's funny because they're pretty direct in terms of, you know, what they need. You know, oh, I got this covered. And you can't take it personally. You know, like it, maybe you have the same skill set as the person you're talking to. And they're like, oh, I don't need somebody like that. I, you know, I already have that. Yeah. And then they move on to the next person quickly. They don't spend a lot of time. Yeah. Um, and it's business. But, you know, it's, it's business. business. And they'll ask you, it, what's your net worth? how much is your liquidity? And you just have to be ready. You know, if you're considering partnering with someone, you, you've got to be ready to answer those questions. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, you know, when I talk to people outside of this world, you know, when talking about financial stuff, like your net worth and liquidity and, um, you know, how much you get, you plan on investing and all that, that could be like, most people have like the stiff arm up, you know, they're like, Hey, that's out of bounds. You, you can't talk to me about, ask me questions about my financial you know, situation. But in this world, they need to know that because, you know, they're applying for a large loan and they need to know what pieces of the puzzle they need to, to get from each person. And so I was really surprised at how quickly people will go there in the, in the conversation. Yep. Um, so be ready for that. But I also like what you said about, you know, spending more time with people, you know, because I think that, you know, if you think about your friendships, 
you know, I still have friends from like growing up, like middle school, high school, like, and I, I think about like, why? And it's because we spent a lot of time together, you know, in college, you have downtime in between classes and you're spending a lot of time together. And then, you know, when you become adults, who do you spend time with? It's either people you work with or people that, you know, other parents of kids, you know, your kids um, on their sports teams. So who do you spend time with? And if you're not spending time with the right people, then get into other groups where you are spending the time with those people. You know, you mentioned you're in a mastermind. Get into a mastermind. Go to meetup groups. Join a mentorship group. You know, surround yourself with people that, you know, are people, one, that you want to hang out with, and two, that have the experience in the, that, you, that you want, you know? Um, so com- that, that was yeah. awesome. Complementary skill sets, like you're, you're talking about, I think is really important because I'm not seeking out other people who are the creatives, you know? Right. I'm seeking out people who are engineers and people who have construction backgrounds and people who love working on the spreadsheets and uh, are people with you know, a lot of experience. I mean, I'm very particular about who I seek out, but then once I find people that I click with, then I spend a lot more time with those people and try to figure out how I can add value to them. The other thing you said was ask, you know, and I think it's tell and ask. I mean, people need to know that you're, you're wanting to partner. People have choices on who they're going to partner with for a lot of different avenues you know, whether it's capital raising or whether it's asset management or whatever the case may be, if you don't tell people that you want to partner with people and you just sit at home, your phone is not going to ring. You know, you have to actually tell people that you're looking for something. You're looking and you're looking to fill this gap and or else it's just not going to happen. Yeah. I mean, would you agree? Yes. I mean, you have to make it happen and it's sort of uncomfortable at the beginning Uh, And I can't tell you how many people now I have come up to me and say, my goal is to GP. Here's my whole background. And then they go into the 30 minute thing. And really, I I coach them with people that are in my meetup group to say, you know, my goal is to GP. Here's what I bring to the table. But I'm trying to figure out how I could add value to a team. What would you suggest? I mean, even for them to ask me that, then I sort of want to help them. You know, like, right, right, like right. I had a lot of people take me kind of under their wing at the beginning because I was like, I'm new. I don't know anybody. You know, what would you suggest that I do when I'm new? Are there particular people I should talk to, particular events I should go to? And there, some of those people I'm very close with now because they did kind of take me under their wing and give me some advice. And um, even when I talked to you at the very beginning, when I was first starting out, I think you talked to me on the phone forever. And that. I always had that connection with you because you were one of the very first people that I ever spoke to, you know, in multifamily. And that's what I try to do is, again, pay it forward and give little coaching tips and advice when people are new. Well, that's great. I'm you know, I'm thankful that you, you give back like that. And I, I think that, you know, when we all get started, we're thinking about ourselves, you know, how do we grow our wealth? How do we break into this industry? How do we you know, get our first deal. Um, but then after you gain that experience, you know, you could just hoard it to yourself or you can share it with others. And like you said, I had so many people help me along the way that you kind of just, you know, it inherently want to help the next person coming in. So there are a lot of people that want to help, but if you just sit at home and they don't know that you need the help and that you want the help and you don't build a relationship where people actually like you, then, you know, it's just not going to happen. So you need to get out there. Oh man. Um, so, you know, where do you go from here? I mean, what, what's kind of the next big stretch goal for you or is that, is it growing the design business? Is it, you know, the investing side, what both at the same time, what, you know, where's your vision for, for Lisa Landry going forward? I feel like it's kind of a triangle. I'm always thinking about, you know, above and beyond multifamily is my my multifamily company. And then Landry designs is my design company. And then you have your whole personal life. So it's like this triangle. And I feel like it needs to be really balanced for me to be happy. Uh, I love a lot of activity and adventure and, 
um, challenges and learning. And so, you know, I kind of get bored quickly if I'm not always learning something new. And I like to work a lot and I enjoy um, the excitement of, of learning new things and mastering, you know, new elements. So my goal is to continue syndicating and just continue to add, you know, GP deals every year, several a year, hopefully. And then with Landry Designs, we're actually working on scaling right now where we're working on setting up satellite offices in different cities across the country versus working out of just our one DFW location. So continuing to grow there. And we've grown a lot in the last few years. Just me getting into multifamily investing has just opened up a lot of uh, new doors for people that I'd never met before. And sure, it, it was a surprise, but we've just added a lot of business to Landry Design. So I'm very, very thankful for that. And then always leaving enough time for yourself and your family and fun and trips and, you know, all of those kind of things too. So I'm working to make sure that everything stays real balanced. Well, I've seen, I've seen you like adventure and you're, you're outdoorsy and you like to do different things. So what do you like to do outside of work? Well, I love like, like adventure travel where you're going and you're, rock climbing and kayaking and the ice and, you know, crazy kind of things like that. I love backpacking and solo backpacking and hiking and kayaking and mountain biking. Talk about some some of the extremes there because like rock climbing, I mean, I think I've rappelled down like a 30 foot rock, but that's different than like I was in California last week and I saw people climbing Yosemite, like this wall, you know, rock that takes three days to climb. So where do you fit on the spectrum there? I'm somewhere in between that. I just got back from Croatia and we did a lot of rock climbing and they had to use ropes and all these things. Like, I mean, it was very, very high and it took us probably six hours, you know, to get to where we were going at the top. Um, Wow. And then I did some ice climbing in Alaska recently, which I, it was ice climbing on a glacier, you know, like straight up with, with all kinds of tools I've never used before. Is, is that like with the, with the boots that have yes, the, spikes the crampons and, and then the ice really? tools. And, and then you have the ice tools and everything. Yes. Really? Yes. It was, it was very challenging, but I made it to the top. How did you even get <laughs> mixed up with that? Did you have a friend that was? There's, a, there's an adventure group uh, that's all women called Explore Chick. Dot com is kind of the website. But anyway, they, they do kind of women's adventure tours. And so those two were women's groups that I went with that are just adventure ones. Uh, that was where I was like kayaking with ice all around your kayak, you know, right by glaciers and stuff. Um, eight hours out there just in the freezing, freezing cold. But otherwise, I mean, I've, I've done backpacking through the woods where I go in and I don't come out for like six days, you know, 70 something miles just with everything on your back. I think that's super fun. And just like I like all those kind of things because you're learning something new and you're testing yourself and seeing where your limits are and you know I don't know I think it's absolutely fun. so one of the things that I think about is you just said um, what I like that you said was that the triangle and one of them was personal you know I think that in this business people can get you know when I ask that question to a lot of syndicators what's the next big stretch goal it's I want to have this many units or this, you know, much assets under management. And I think that some people are, they just keep pushing the, the goal further and further and they're very successful. But, you know, I think that there's a time where you have to celebrate some of your successes and you need to also, you know, enjoy life a little bit, enjoy the journey. Um, and so it sounds like you definitely carve out time to do that. Yeah. I think when you're real driven, when you're kind of type A personalities, which most of the people in multifamily are, I've found. Uh, yeah. It's so common. It's just, it's really like our people, we found our people, you know. Um, but I think your tank can go dry pretty quick. So I think it's important to just, you know, refill that tank and take some time and let your mind rest a little bit and kind of assess your goals where you are and, and then start again. And sometimes, and I don't know if you found this, but sometimes I'm on vacation and I'm, I'm like an early riser. My family likes to sleep in. And so I'm down by the pool or the beach or wherever we are with coffee and reading a book. And all of a sudden, maybe an idea comes to me that I'm like, holy cow, that 
like I can't wait to get back to yeah. impl- to implement that. And had I just been, you know, working day to day and I didn't take that time, um, I may not have ever thought of that idea. Yeah, and that absolutely. could be a, a huge have a huge impact on your business too. So, um, cause, but you know, I think of business as being, look, it's, it's about making money, but there's also a fun aspect to it. Right. I mean, you know, having a successful outcome, I mean, it's, there's financial reward, but then it's also, I don't know, part of life that you did something good, you know? Yeah. And if you don't get up every day, kind of excited to do what you do, like, you know, whatever your, your work is, then I think you need to find something else because, or you need <laughs> right. to take a you just, you take just a hit a bunch of people on the head right there. Yeah. Holy cow! You need to take a vacation, or you need to find something else because you should wake up pretty excited. And then, like you say, when you do get away and your mind gets quiet and not so full of your to do list of a thousand things, that's when these big ideas kind of come in. Usually, you know, your brain is yeah. open enough to let big ideas come in and. And those are what we need to focus on, I think, as entrepreneurs are the big ideas. Yeah, I love it. So, hey, if people want to get to know you better, like where, where can they go to, to, to learn more about you and contact you? Sure. Two different spots. The designs side for Landry Designs. Our website is LandryDesigns.com. And then our multifamily website is GrowAboveAndBeyond.com. And so either way, you can reach out through there to contact me and, um, you know, we'll go from there. So growaboveandbeyond.com is, is and spelled out? Yes, A-N-D. it is. It's A-N-D. Okay, fantastic. Yes. Well, Lisa, I really appreciate you coming on. And um, I am so thankful that I have a resource that is creative because I'm not. So thank you for that. Listeners, I hope that you enjoyed that one. Uh, definitely check her out. And, and I'm surprised, but she said that she covers the country. So if you are a syndicator anywhere, you should be reaching out to her. So um, until next week, signing off. Thank you for watching Darren Batchelder's Real Estate Investing Show. If you liked the episode, please click the like button and subscribe to the show. If you already are subscribed, then thank you. And please share the show with a friend. Check out other free resources at darrenbatchelder.com slash learn. 